Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to another edition of ECH Post Game Live. Uh, you have not not the most fun circumstances to start this one off, as the Kraken get outclassed by the Kings in LA. They lose five two, and unfortunately are mathematically eliminated from playoff contention with this loss in regulation. Uh, a lot going on in this game, though. A lot of stuff to break down. But before we do that. Got to talk about our sponsor, Flatstick Pub, and very timely uh, time to talk about them because the very next Kraken game, uh, you can watch the game along with Dylan. We're having our live watch party at Flatstick Pub at the South Lake Union location. It's going to be a really fun time. I think probably a better game we're going to get just given the opponent. Look, the Kraken, they, they haven't shown the ability to beat a team that's anywhere near good, but you know what? They're really good, it seems like, at beating bottom three teams in the league. And you know what? They play another one of them next game against Anaheim. So it's going to be a really fun time at the watch party. Win or lose, though, it's about enjoying everyone's company. And I know Dylan cannot wait for that. He's going to be up there at Flatstick Pub. But right now, he is actually in L.A. at Crypto.com Arena. So he's going to join us a little bit later to talk about the game, talk about his takeaways, what it was like being there. Uh, so he's going to join us in a little bit. But first, <laughs> Chris is asking, did Dylan remember to bring five gum? I will ask him. We can ask him lots of questions, including that one. Uh, I think he brings it to every road game he goes to, but he doesn't always uh, resort to breaking it out of the package. I think he saves it for important times. Uh, but of course, we can ask him ourselves a little bit later. So jumping right into chat here uh, from Zoe, uh, that got chippy. I would love to know what Dunn said to the ref to get two misconducts. Uh, it did get chippy. Yeah, and especially with Vince Dunn involved, taking a lot of contact whether it was from hits or even just that unlucky puck that hit him in the the arm wrist hand area uh dunn took a lot of contact and i think you know we know he has a temper i i imagine he must have said something on his way off the ice and uh yeah being that frustrated i'm, I'm sure he didn't hold back so i will probably never know but yeah it would be interesting to know what he said to the officials there uh, super chat here from Light. Thank you for super chat of the night. At least I'm happy with the fight at the end and Maddie and Shane playing to win. This was a loss I wanted for tanking reasons, TBH. Yeah, it does help as far as draft position. I mean, that's true. Every loss from this point out uh, does help in that sense. And yeah, the Kraken did give some fight at the end. I mean, they could have gone away in the third period, but they didn't. I mean, they did score a couple goals. And I mean, I think that is a little refreshing given how things have gone earlier in the season where they haven't always fought back in those positions especially with the Kings playing the one three one they are a tough team to get position against and to score goals against and credit to the Kraken they did manage to do that at least late uh JMG uh fed up play the kids is this all hacks decision or is Ron involved in this um so I first of all I agree with the message play the kids and I'm sure you're referring to Ryan Winterton being a scratch tonight in addition to Logan Morrison now being a scratch for the last two games and uh, yeah, I, I struggle to see the logic in that decision. At this point of the season, it's not about wins and losses. It's about giving younger players the opportunity to play. You're seeing that with Shane Wright and what he's been able to do. I don't know why you would call up those two guys and then not play them. I think you either have to play the kids or send them back down to Coachella Valley because they need to be playing hockey games. Being in the press box right now doesn't do anything for their development. So I think a decision has to be made soon. Maybe they were trying to wait for the Anaheim game and avoid them going out to play against this Kings team, which you know, they are a physical team. But I don't know that you really have to shelter your young players from – a team that's not overly physical and is just a playoff bubble team. I don't see the harm in, in playing them tonight. Uh, and, you know, having the vets in certainly didn't help you win. Um, and as for the, whose decision it is, uh, once the guys are on the team, it's all Hackstall's decision who gets in the lineup. It's Francis's decision to call them up and to have them on the roster. But once there's a, a roster of players, Dave Hackstall decides who plays. So that's on him. Um, Going back into chat here. B, well, playoffs are officially dead for the year. Tanking time continues, I guess. At least they didn't get shut out. Yeah, I think it is better they didn't get shut out, too. I think it had been about 110 minutes or so of playtime since the Kraken had scored against a playoff team. 
So it was good to see them get a couple goals there just to end that streak, if anything. Um, Julia, my expectations are so low that I was only half watching the third until Lars started fighting. And they looked good for like 15 minutes there. After that fourth goal, I thought they'd lose steam again. Yeah, they, they did have a good stretch there. I mean, it was kind of too little too late, but still, they, they didn't give up. And this is more reminiscent, I think, of the Kraken in year one. And I mean that in a good way, because that team just clearly did not have the skill to beat playoff level teams but they never went away and they never stopped fighting and i think that's what we saw from the kraken tonight and you know what that's an improvement over the effort issues that they've had in the recent past uh super chat here from schultz let me scroll down to it did hack scratch the kids because there was a mathematical chance of the playoffs can't think of any other reason should we shut down done so no i don't think that had anything to do with it everybody in the organization knew at that point or knows today the playoffs were not going to be in the cards whatever the result of this game playoffs were not happening and everybody was on board with that uh no i think it probably just came down to tatar being a veteran player who Hackstall maybe wanted to get back in the lineup and just give him another chance uh, to do something and, and to make a name for himself. And also maybe the team might be considering re-signing him potentially. He's on an expiring deal, but I think of those three guys between him, Belmar, and Yamamoto, who have been scratches regularly, Tatar probably has the best chance of being brought back, even though I think it's still unlikely. Maybe give him an audition here. Personally, I didn't think he played that great. He had a turnover that kind of led to one of the goals against. Um, Trevor Moore made him just look silly with a skating move shortly after. I, I didn't really see a lot from Tatar that would justify keeping him uh, after tonight. Um, Maddie, I find it interesting that all the pests on the team are on the same line right now. Is this typical? I mean, sometimes teams will load up their, their pests or their grinders. That's kind of more what a traditional third line used to be in the NHL before you'd see skill kind of get involved in that a little bit more, skilled players. Um, but yeah, we're seeing kind of an old school third line grinded out pest line. And you know what? I really liked what we saw from the Gord Tanev and, um, and Karche line tonight. I mean... They, they worked really well as a fourth line. I'm going to see if I can look up their ice time real quick because I, I want to know what their role was. I didn't have the chance to look at that. But, I mean, I think that's a fourth line because on paper they were the fourth line that will win you a ton of matchups, and, and they did in this game. Only problem is it's expensive with Cord making over five mil, Tanev at three and a half. But I really liked what they brought, uh, and they got under the king's skin a little bit at times. Um, let's see. Um uh, Brooke asked Dylan, how excited were you to see a Larson fight in person? I will ask him that, of course. Uh, Got to get his answer on that. Um, uh, Kraken fan page asking, yeah, why not start the kids? Tuna knows he won't be here next year. Yeah, kind of addressed that. Um, Christian, how does the power play improve as long as McFarlane is heading it? Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, they did score a power play goal in this one tonight. Nice little pass down low from Bjorkstrand to Burakovsky. But yeah, I... I've kind of seen enough, especially on that four on three um, where it's, I don't know what it is about four on three, five on three situations where they where they draw something up. And it just seems like they, they can't ever figure anything out unless it's five on four. But um, yeah, I mean, they, they did score one tonight, but yet yeah, still still below average. Patrick with the fire hack uh, figured we'd see an onside agreeing. I figured we'd see at least one of those in here tonight. Um, Lindsay, we're free. <laughs> um and a Kraken fan page, not expecting RJ to pop up. Yeah, sorry, everybody, that it's me. I know uh, we're, we're missing Dylan at the moment, but uh, he'll he'll join us in not too long. I can't imagine the media availabilities after this one would last all that long. He's just got to find a good spot at the arena. Um, Sean, at least they decided to play in the third. Genuinely concerned about Hack's future. Well, I, I don't know if everybody saw the article from Jeff Baker that came out a couple days ago, or was it yesterday, that um, that Francis, at least you know, throughout the rest of the season, is safe. I mean, he's not going to be fired midseason, which, of course, that makes sense. But still no confirmation on after the year whether he's going to be there. Um, and the coop RJ doesn't the power play doesn't work because they don't move or pass through the dangerous areas. Yeah, no, in general, absolutely. Like, I mean, that pass though in the goal was through a dangerous area. They just they don't do it enough. And yeah, you're right, they really don't move. I, I'm with you. I, I think there needs to be change on the power play. Uh, from Kraken fan page official super chat. Thank you very much. Uh, start Joey for the majority of the season. Not happy with Gru's last few starts. Don't get me wrong, I love the guys, but yeesh. Go Kraken. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I don't think this one's on Grubauer when you don't get any goal support till the third. Um, you know, that last one on a breakaway too, that was, you know, you might like to stop that five hole, but still it's on a breakaway. I don't think you can really blame him too much for that. 
I, I don't know. I, I think both goalies right now are playing just kind of average. I think Joey's cooled off a little bit because he got a bit burnt out. I think Grubauer is just, you know, playing fairly average at the moment. He's giving the team a chance to win if they play well. If not, they're not going to win the game. He's not going to steal anything. Honestly, I don't have a problem with just kind of the, the one, one rotation at this point. Um, so I, I don't know. We'll, we'll, the goaltending situation, I feel like doesn't matter a ton at this point, but I think we'll see pretty even starts for, for each of those two guys. Um, let's take a look back at chat. Um, and Ryan, what was with that lineup? What are we doing as a franchise? Yeah. Kind of, kind of covered it with the earlier with the, the play the kids, but yeah, from here on out, if, if they have those guys, Winterton and Morrison scratch tomorrow uh, in a couple days against the ducks. Yeah. I don't know what you're doing. Um, you either got to send them down or play them next game. Uh, Lindsay Kraken undefeated on flat stick watch party nights. That's true. And I like their odds uh, in the next one. Uh, given their recent games against the ducks. I don't know. I, I think, I think the vibes are always good for those watch party nights for sure. Um, Let's see. Uh, Sam, how's Dylan's record with attending in-person games this year? Anyone kept track of that? I wonder if he's looked it up. I, I didn't keep track of it, but I know the last two or three the Kraken have lost, but I know prior to that, it was very good. Um, Blue Hours Productions on the bright side, at least the Trevor Moore hat trick was on the road and not at Climate Pledge Arena. Yeah, I'm surprised it actually uh, wasn't at Climate Pledge Arena. He seems to always score a goal when I'm there. Um, for those who don't know, I will mention it. So Trevor Moore is a, is from Thousand Oaks, California, that, and I am also from Thousand Oaks, California. So same hometown. He always seems to do something impressive when I'm around. Maybe that also applies for Dylan given tonight. Um, uh, Angela, RJ at home, Dylan joining from the arena. It's backwards night. Yeah, it is. It's backwards night. But hey, that's the, the SoCal games. That That's what happens. It'll also be backwards night, I guess, at the at the watch party with Dylan there, and, and I'll be here running the post game. Um, let's see. Uh, Cole, I felt like the Kraken left Shane out to dry while he was out there. So many misplays, a couple of his own too. Uh, he put in the effort. Yeah, I mean, th that line, I didn't really notice them stand out a ton in this game. I mean, there were there were a few times where where Shane looked to be just a little off the same page with his line mates. And you can you know put that on the line mates as well, I guess, as far as being in the right spots. But yeah, they, they didn't look quite as good as they did against San Jose because they didn't really have the same time and space. I mean, it is tough to play against that 1-3-1 uh, that the Kings have. I'm looking at 5-on-5, five five, though, ice time. That Shane Wright line had the most of any line at five on five, almost 13 minutes of ice time and uh, pretty even. I mean, shot attempts 11 to 10 in their favor, expected goals percentage 52%. So um, it'd be interesting to see who they were matched up with the most, but they played them pretty even that whole time. Um, let's see, Jake, it's my fault. I moved and can't be there to bring my good luck to LA games anymore. And I, I heard there are a lot of Kraken fans in the building though for that one. So um, that's good to see at least. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, Sam pointing out to the Tatar turnover that led to the goal. Um, Nicole, will any of these remaining games look fun or will the team look even more dead? I, I think the next three games could, could potentially look fun. I mean, they're playing Anaheim next and I just, I, I don't see how the Ducks win that game, given the way they've been playing. We'd have to see a totally different Ducks team uh, for, for them to even have a chance at winning. They look like they're interested in throwing games away. So I think that one could be fun. Um, and then uh, after, and then what is it? Arizona, which that was a close game last time. The Kraken were in it at least, but it's at home. And I think the team's a little more motivated playing in front of the home crowd. And then San Jose on fan appreciation night. We've seen that before. Year one, they played against the Sharks on fan appreciation night. I think they shut them out three to nothing. It was a Chris Drieger shutout. So the guys got up for that one. I think that could be a really fun game. As for the final road trip, uh, we'll see. I, I, I feel like the results might look more or less like this one. Um, let's see. Um, Sam, Money Puck last I checked had Kraken largely in favor in the winnow meter with Eberly had 1.5 expected goals. Is that accurate or not? So I'm on there right now. Oh, wow. They really turned the tables. I think after two periods, the Kings were at like uh, almost 80% on the winnow meter. So the third period really changed that. Yeah. If you look at the, the expected goals graph in that period, I, like in for that game on Money Puck, the third period, it just completely flipped. So that, that is entirely the third period. So I, I don't think it's fully, it, I don't think it tells the full story, I guess there, Sam. Um, 
Let's see. Um, Uh, Viran, what on earth would you be learning from a Tatar audition? He's played 39 games. I, I guess more instead of audition, like last chance, like show something or else, you know, we're not going to re-sign you. Maybe, maybe more like that. But yeah, I don't think there's much that you can learn realistically at this point. I'm just trying to think of what the, the thought process might be, given the benefit of the doubt there. Um, and yeah, a lot of people agreeing here. Don't like uh, benching the kids and scratching the kids. I, I agree with you completely. Um, Maddie, I've been noticing good things from Berkey lately. I have too. I mean, the effort's still been up and down depending on the game, but he's at least been producing a little bit more recently uh, once he kind of broke that seal and started scoring some goals. So as long as he can stay healthy, uh, I, I'm feeling good about his production for next season. Just He just needs that time to get into a rhythm, and I think we're starting to see that. Also, he was able to take a few big hits tonight and bounce back up. So I think that's also a good sign. I like to see that. Um, yeah, DDB, I've been a hack defender, not Stan, and it really feels like he doesn't have any answers here. At this point, I feel like he has been given enough time and won't shed any tears if he goes. Um, yeah, I mean, I've seen a lot of people, you know, kind of changing their stance on, on Hackstall and, you know, whether he's kind of had enough of a chance or not. Um, so it's interesting to see there from a, a Hackstall defender. Um, uh, Drew, dropping this in here and leaving so I can listen to this tomorrow at work. Uh, look for a CV jersey behind the bench during the watch party. Awesome. Sounds like you'll be hitting up the Anaheim game. Uh, yeah, that's going to be a fun one. And I love you wearing the Firebirds jersey there. Love, love everybody representing the Firebirds. They are a fun team. Um, let's see. Julia Lars finds out Dylan's in the building and knows if he can't at least score a goal, he's got to do something interesting. That's true. Lars is always interesting when Dylan's in the building. And of course, he's got to stand up for his partner there. I mean, he sees Vince Dunn take that big hit, no hesitation, especially after just not having his partner for as long as he did. I'm sure Lars wanted to step in there and send a message. So, I mean, good for him too, especially with the game out of reach. That's more important than, than whatever penalty you might take. Um, Lindsay, I support Shane, right? But also Shane's wrongs. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, uh, gotta, gotta support him through the thick and thin. That's a good one. Um, and, and there are going to be plenty more Shane, Wright puns. I am sure even just through the rest of this season. Um, Chris, worst part of missing the playoffs for the Kraken is once the season is over, we get the Sounders and the Mariners to keep us company. Go tips. Yeah, it's, it's rough in the Seattle sports landscape right now. It sounds like the Mariners did not do well tonight. Uh, eight nothing last I checked. So that's uh, unfortunate. Um, oh, yeah. And then Alan dared Dylan to ask Hackstall in post game. Hope he did it. Yeah, we'll see if, if Dylan saw that and, and we get an answer from Hackstall about that. Um, I don't know. If not, I'm going to definitely ask once they come back home because I think that is something that needs to be addressed there. Um, Let's see. Um, Viran and cap hits are not an acceptable basis for lineup construction. Yeah, no, I I, I got that. <laughs> um, Brooke asking, can Francis fire the power play coach or is that a hack stall decision? Uh, it can be either. Usually it's on the head coach to decide who the assistants are going to be, but we've certainly seen in the past teams, especially when the coach is maybe on shaky ground, the the GM and the team informing the coach that yes, there will be changes to the assistance uh, and it's not always in the head coach's hands. So we'll, we'll see what we get after the seasons there. Usually teams might see that as kind of a half measure that they can take where they don't have to fully fire the head coach, but they can make some changes behind the bench. Um, so, I mean, that kind of thing wouldn't fully surprise me at this point. Um, uh, see, uh, Bryce with how poor the effort has been and then still favoring veterans at the end of a lost season, feels like they've created an environment where veterans feel okay, not to give the effort they need to. I, I think there's something to that. I mean, you look at when Morrison and Winterton were called up initially too, and we thought, okay, great. This is a message sent to the veterans. You need to play better. You need to give a better effort. And then Hackstall just kind of backpedaled from that right away, said they didn't make the decision, uh, after the Montreal game it was made prior to that game. And no, it's not a message to the veterans. I, I do think a lot of the veteran players feel very comfortable right now, knowing that they are not going to be scratched. The guys who are you know, under contract for next year anyway. So uh, yeah, I, I, it shouldn't be surprising when we don't always see the effort that we know can be there. Although tonight, I, you know, they finished the game strong. At least this wasn't the same as some of the other games, as far as complete lack of effort. Um, 
Oh, James, you wonder if Dylan is watching to see if any Kraken players were laughing on the way to the locker room. Yeah, I don't, you can't see that in LA. That's just a mullet arena thing. Um, that's that's one of the weird benefits of, of mullet is you can see that stuff and the fans can see that stuff, but uh, not going to get that information in LA, uh, unfortunately, I guess. Um, Edward Kraken is so nice. Hardly even taking a shot on goal when the other team has a player in the penalty box. Yeah, the power play uh, wasn't, wasn't ideal tonight, even though they got one. Um, Steven, say it with the Go Kings Go, huge win. Sorry, Kraken fans. I like the Kraken too, but I've been a Kings fan for 35 years. All right, we got a Kings fan here coming in peace. That's still a fairly kind message there. And yeah, I mean, big win for the Kings as far as their uh, their playoff chase. I mean, that was a huge one. Kraken could have uh, done quite a bit to play spoiler tonight if it had gone the other way. Um, and then on stop, uh, was surprised to see Grubauer start again. Seemed like Hack was switching them out every other game. Yeah, I, I was kind of surprised not to see him stick with just that one, 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 one rotation. Um, but yeah, I, I do wonder the thinking behind that. Did, and especially since Decord had a really good game in LA earlier this season, I, I do wonder what the thinking was there. Um, so <laughs> expect the unexpected, says Coop. Exactly. Um, and then Patrick, is there some contract stuff with the kids? I know that Shane has some limit on number of games you mentioned. Uh, that's a good question, Patrick. So uh, no, that stuff doesn't apply for either Morrison or Winterton. Because for Shane, you have two things. You have the Calder eligibility where, you know, whether he's considered a rookie or not. Morrison and Winterton, first of all, they're, they're not going to win the Calder. They're not going to be in the Calder conversation. They're just not that level of player. Nothing wrong with that. But they will still be considered rookies next year anyway because they won't have hit the threshold for games because they didn't play games last year. So that doesn't matter. And then also um, as far as like the ELC slide, uh, both Morrison and Winterton are too old to have their ELC slide. So it's just going to count for a year no matter what. So that's not relevant either. So yeah, as Light just saying, there is not. But that's why there's not. Um, Nicole, every broadcast they mention him being from Thousand Oaks. I can't say his name without going uh, Trevor Moore from Thousand Oaks, California. Yeah, sa same here, although, you know, <laughs> you can see why for me. Um, but uh, let's see. Uh, Maddie, are Schwartz and Everly likely to be Wright's line mates next season too? Curious how his chemistry with Berkey would be. I think they're going to try some different things uh, through training camp, through the preseason. I definitely don't think it's decided at this point. Also, you, you never know who's even going to be around and healthy at the start of next season anyway. So no, I'd say probably it's more likely it'll be somebody else, but they may go with that just because they've had this time now to build some chemistry, but um, it's just going to be a clean slate starting in training camp and we'll, we'll see who they put them with. Um, Jessica, so sorry Dylan had to watch over 40 minutes of Kraken being boring. I know your pain, man. Yeah, I mean, it was a boring start to this one. I, I uh, Unfortunately, I didn't get to use, I may have caught it on the broadcast, but at the start of the second period, I think, there was a good video clip of they went to Joey Decord and he was just sitting there and, and yawning. So I, I might use that at some point. I feel like that's a good clip to have around, just Joey yawning at the, the game and how it was going. Um, uh, Ricky, did you see the report where Forsland is going to Boston next year? I, I did see that article. I mean, not really from any kind of, source that I know to be reliable or in the know or anything. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of just disregarding that at the moment. Um, and then light Forsland signed a five-year deal. So I don't know how he'd leave for Boston. Yeah. I mean, when it's, you know, no serious outlets are, are really corroborating that or anything. So I, I wouldn't put any stock into it personally. Um, uh, Lindsay, uh, lose lots, win some for Caden Lindstrom. <laughs> that's, that's a good one. Got to share that one with Dylan. Uh, we got to have all these for the different prospects. Um, Rebecca leaving crypto right now. Got to shout out the fantastic company tonight, meeting Jules and her dad. Thanks Dylan for coming down to hook her up with some stickers. That's awesome to see. Glad Dylan uh, got to meet up with you too. I saw that developing on the discord. Really happy you were able to make that work. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's, I can't wait to hear, uh, from Dylan about that as well. Um, uh, Gabrielle, what do you see happening with the goalie signing today? Is that a goodbye grew or just growing the next generation? Yeah, it's it's a next generation thing. Um, the, the goalie signing today, and I am trying to remember the name. It's a Swedish name. Um, 
I'm sure someone will put it in chat before I even get it. Ah, Victor Ostman. That's right. Um, so yeah, he's uh, an undrafted free agent signing out of college. Um, he had some good seasons at the university of Maine, apparently lost his starting job at Maine this year, but still potentially promising big goalie. That's just a, a prospect pipeline type of signing. And we'll see if he gets a shot at the AHL level next year with the firebirds. Uh, that would probably be what we're looking at. Maybe back up with the firebirds or, or below that. Um, so yeah, not, not a threat at the NHL and, any anytime soon uh but just a prospect that they're bringing in um all right we've got dylan here ready to join us live from crypto.com arena hey dylan how's it going uh doing okay i mean i i had to watch the, the kraken lose in the building for the first time tonight so that was a little bittersweet but uh yeah i mean it was it was a late season kraken game Yep. I, I mean, I, we've kind of reached that point in here where, you know, we we don't like that uh, Hackstall scratched the kids. You know, we, we felt like the Kraken just, you know, weren't really good enough, you know, compared to the Kings in this one. Uh, we, we've kind of gone through the, the main points. Uh, but some questions for you, Dylan, from earlier in chat. First of all, what was it like to see an Adam Larson fight in person? That was really cool. And I mean, the situation was terrible, right? Because Vince Dunn right, takes right. elbow to the head. It doesn't get called. Kraken end up going four, you know, four and four. Um, I mean, everybody was pretty upset about that. Dumoulin talked about that as, as you know, a disappointing kind of way that happened. But to see Lars, you know, step up for his line mate, for his, for his defensive partner like that, I thought that was huge. And the way he did it right away spoke volumes about uh, who he is, how he is. Um, yeah, and it's, it gives you a glimpse, like, He's one of those guys that, that you know, he's not going to start things, but he'll finish them, right? And you, you mm -hmm. got that impression watching that. Yeah, he definitely finished it there. Did you see what happened with Dunn and the game misconduct afterward? Did he, was he over-talking, barking at the ref or saying something? Could you tell? That's all I can think of, too. I know, you know, and I had talked about that during the game. Like I said, they never announced anything to us. Nobody, like, it never, it never came through on our end, so... Um, I was pretty surprised, like when all of a sudden it was just, I, I literally, I saw the tweet, right. And then that was it. And it was like, yeah. Oh, I guess he's gone. Um, yeah, we, we had no idea up on the bridge. So I, that's as good a guess as any, cause we were looking at the replay and you could see he was petitioning for the elbowing call, right. He's saying like, that's my effing head. It was my effing head. Right. Like, so he was already in that vein. If he kept that going. I could see maybe that that happening, but what's weird about it is this was a game that was already chippy. Refs got to be looking at the score at that point and saying this could escalate. I think that's partly why they just were were taking everybody, gave them you know the the two minors and stuff. Um, but like, I don't know. I, I feel like you're not gonna like that's that's how you're gonna try to get the game under control. Is like the guy barking at you, and you send him away. Like I, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Well, see, if you kick him out of the game, Kings players can't hit him again because he took a lot of contact before that, too, at various points. You take him out of the game. So they were trying, they were just trying to protect Vince Dunn. They had his best. Yes, clearly. Advice, let's say. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Byron says the listed penalty is abusive language. So, yeah, that, that kind of that, gives you the idea. That works. I mean, look, we've, we've talked about it. We, the Dundertaker, it's a little bit of a temper at times. We know that about him. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, quickly, X Kids Z asking, did you bring the five gum? I did. Okay, so I started chewing it right away. Like, like oh, you did. Up, I was like, I'm gonna do this, and so and and then I was like, let me wait and like uh, they'll play well, and I'll do like a big reveal, and then I kept it. I kept it in my mouth for the first two periods. So getting rid of it made goal. all the stuff happen. Apparently so. Yes, it was. It was getting rid of it that was the problem. Like five I said, gum I was works. Doing everything. I was doing everything I've ever done in this building. Like I said, I've never had to watch a loss here for the Kraken, and um, it not, just nothing was going to work tonight. Yeah, I, I guess the five gum works in mysterious ways. Uh, also, Maddie asking, is Dylan coming to us from a bubble? Yeah, so I'm, I'm like, I was trying to get the rink. They got like beer leaguers out there. The lighting. Is oh well, just, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. So I thought like, oh, we'll get some people. But like, look at how it wants to just overexpose. Yeah. The rink. Like, you can't see them. They look like ghosts out there. So I'm just going to do this. I figured it was also better than that background. Yeah, like but, kings in the background. But I don't know. Lighting-wise, I might have to do that. 
All right. Well, anyway, let's let's talk about uh, after the game. What did you hear from the players in Hackstall? What was the general takeaway from this one? Uh, the big takeaway, and I would agree with this, was that they, they had a good effort, they played hard, but they also left some on the table, right? And I think that compared to the last month or so for this team, they did play hard, right? There was a lot more effort. The fact that they stayed in it in the third period and were trying to get things going and picked up a couple goals, like that is something that we weren't seeing from this team two weeks ago so that is a step in the right direction but at the same time you gave and, and this was actual words you gave them a ton of chances right like it wasn't like the kings came out and and took a bunch from you like they gave them a lot there was turnover problems there was you know, look at the first three kings goals they're all scored right there in and around the net with not really any crack and defenders around to do anything about those goals like so there was there was still issues in this one but i still felt like you know, this was this was a much better effort than what I saw in Arizona, right? Like this team yeah, has kind of turned things around from the effort perspective. So I will applaud them for that. Um, but uh, but yeah, I think Hackstall kind of nailed it with with the I liked our effort, but we left some on the table. Yeah, and they they didn't go away in the third, and it would have been very easy to do that given you're down three nothing. The game's over against a really stifling defensive team, and they didn't go away. Uh, so Alan asking here, uh, I don't know if you saw on Twitter or not, but he, uh, double dog dare, triple dog dare does maybe to ask Haxtell about uh, sc- scratching Morrison and Winterton and that decision to do that. Uh, did we get an answer on on his thought process behind that? No, I did not see that. I didn't know that. I I should have been asking that. Um, I don't know how well received that would have been. <laughs> just yeah, just... I know that I, I, because again, we we both know like having done this like after after a game like this, it's a great question for like the practice the next day. Yeah, and I think you'll um, get a better answer. But let's 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 be real, right? Like we we listened to a lot of of Hackstall. Like he he was just going to give an answer, something along the lines of you know. Uh, this is a good team, playoffs on the line, wanted to put our best lineup forward. We felt like this was the right group to go in, you know, against this team and, and play with, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, no, I, I think like that's, that's, it probably would have been I'm something not, similar. Yeah, no, I'm, and I'm not saying this, like, to be mean or, or, or to be bad or anything, but, like, that's just, that's what coaches do, right? Like, that's not even a Hacksaw thing. Like, any coach is going to do that. It's, co- it's called Maurice coach speak for a reason. One. Yeah, Paul Maurice would be the only one. Yeah, basically. Um, so as I scroll on in here in chat, and by the way, I've, I've, uh, I know I've skipped over someone. Dylan got on here, so if you have know, any questions Alice. for Dylan, I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, I see that from Allison. The I wasn't gonna read it, but I can see that you see it there, Dylan. Um, <laughs> yeah, let's see. Um, Jessica asking, do you think if we'd kept work hard veterans like Donato and Giordano, we'd be seeing more effort still, or would they have fallen prey to our current apathy? I. Uh... I don't know. I, I think a guy like Gio only knows one way to play. And and we're seeing that even still now, right? Like it's, it, it has it changed. Yes. It's had to, as he's gotten older, everybody does. Um, but he, he, he just plays with like a certain level of expectation for himself. I think Donato the same way, right? You're looking at Donato on a terrible Chicago team and yet he's out there playing like Ryan Donato. Um, so I, I think that there, there's an element of that. I think, we can also point to the fact that, you know, the, the kids coming up were playing that way, right? Like, that's how that's how they were coming in. They were coming in with that fight. They were playing the same way they do in Coachella Valley. Um, I, I think there's something to that. Would it be to the highest level? Probably not. Like, a, a season yeah. like this wears on everybody. It gets to everybody. I think, I think there would have been some level of that. But also specifically with like a Ryan Donato guy. I mean, he'd be playing just to stay in the league. So he would, he would probably stay pretty hungry for that. Yeah. And, and also, I mean, I think you also have to look at in this type of situation, once the season is lost, I don't know, does it, does it really matter to have a guy like that given 110%? I mean, maybe for the team as a whole, just to not get everybody so down, but it, it doesn't help you for draft position. It doesn't help you get any close to the playoffs. What does it really do for you? Well, I mean, it sends a message to the fans, right? Here's, that's true. Fans, fans are asking the question. Fans want to see that, right? Like that's that's your expectation as a fan when you go to the game is that your team's going to at least try, right? Like you know if your team is bad, if they're tanking, right? Go ask San Jose Sharks fans, go ask Chicago Blackhawks fans, Anaheim Ducks fans, right? They know their team is going to lose two thirds of the time when they go to a game, but they still want to be entertained and they still want their team to look like they're going for it, right? So I think it would still be important. To have that around, yes, it's ultimately meaningless. And yes, you can bomb 
borrow some of my nihilistic output for it. But at the same time, I, I do think that it's an important thing to, to go out there and show. Yeah, I, I guess some of the nihilism has rubbed off on me, unfortunately, Dylan, when I was thinking about that. So we, we switch. It is it is like opposite day, as everyone was it pointing is, out yeah. with you at the game, me here. Yeah. Um, um, so Coop asking, because there's been a lot of conversation about Hackstall and we got a couple fire hacks in chat and, and you know, that kind of stuff has come up again. And Coop asking, do we have any concern if if we wait to fire Hackstall until a slow start next season that it may mean another year without a discernible system? I know it takes years to build, but training camp is valuable. I, what, what do you think about that? I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm really on the fence with it all. Like just to just to be frank. Right. Yeah. Like, I, I can I can see it kind of go both ways. I don't know. I, I think ideally, yes, that's that's probably the better way of going about it. It, it would be to to make a change, give that person the full off season, let them have training camp, do all of that stuff. Um, at the same time, though, there's nothing that says Hacksaw can't do that. Right. Like you don't need to make a change to also have that same thing happen. So. Um, and I think at this point of the year, you know, well, what, he's not going to like come out with a system now, there wouldn't be a point in doing yeah. it. Um, but I think that it's kind of become clear to everybody involved that that's, if he stays, that's what it would, would, he, it would be with the understanding that that has to happen. Right. Exactly. And I, I kind of in the same spot there. And and I don't know if we talked about this last post game, but the, the report from Jeff Baker that Hackstall is going to continue to be the coach, at least through the rest of the season, of course, which that shouldn't surprise anybody at this point. It would just make no sense, you know, having an interim for seven games or less. Um, Only but, if you, you know, it's still to see something from one of the assistants, right? Like we, we had talked about that, right? Like if the, the only case scenario in which that makes sense is if you really believe in like Jay Leach. Right. As a potential yeah. head coach, you would want to give him that time so that you can kind of see what he would look like. How would he run things with our team in with this group of guys, with our facilities, the day to day? You'd, you'd have like a hands on look. Those that would have been the only reason. And obviously they didn't feel that way. Yeah. And with the games ticking away, too, it just makes less and less sense. But Francis was still fairly noncommittal about, you know, for next season. He didn't commit to Hackstall coming back next year. I mean, did I don't know if you if you read what, what yeah, Baker wrote there and if you have any, you know, thoughts on on kind of between the lines what that might mean. I mean, look, it why wouldn't you be? Right? Like after a season like this, everybody's disappointed, front office coaching staff players, ownership, right? Everybody's disappointed. Fans, right? Expectations were not met. Performance was mm -hmm. not what it needs to be in a results driven business. So it, yeah. it doesn't make a lot of sense to do that. I thought that his comment about how, look, they wait till the off season, they, they wait till the off season starts, they go through, you know, their debrief at the end of the year. And that's kind of when those decisions get made. And I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think that's the appropriate way of doing it. And I think that's the appropriate statement to have if you're Ron Francis is we're going to wait, we're going to take a look at things once it's officially over, we have the time to do that. We're not, you know, dealing with traveling all over the place and, and dealing with the day to day grind of the season still. Um, we can we can take some time, get everybody in a room, talk things out, talk about what the plans for the future would be from him and his staff, right? And then front office and ownership can make the decision after having those conversations. And you're just not going to do that while you've still got a handful of games remaining. Right. Yeah, that's the, the best way to go about the process. And we got some super chats here. Uh, first one from Michael. Uh, to me, this game seems like the rest of the season. Turn the puck over in our end and take shots, but miss the frame. So not on goal. Yeah, there was a lot of that, right? I mean, 10 shots on goal for the first two periods. Um, Kraken came out and they 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 did a good job of like controlling possession. It was like, oh, hey, are they going to be able to beat the one three one, right? Like they they're just yeah. going to grind in the offensive zone, just sit behind the three, and and then you can just kind of feast on the one, right? Um, that went away pretty quick. Yep. The five gun wore off fast, um, but yeah, I mean. Goal scored. Uh, there, there was there, there's an element of that, and it it is. I mean, this has been some of the problem this year, right? The defensive lapses, right? Like I talked about those first three goals. Nobody's at home. Why is there no defenseman around for kind of any of those three? Like that's a problem. Um, you're not, you know, I, I've defended it in the past. The idea that you're not trying to win off of shot volume, you're trying to win off of shot quality. We kind of know that that's the situation with this team. It's how they scored a couple goals, you know, the couple goals that they did score. 
Um, but it does mean that a lot of your chances may not end up on net or you don't you walk away out of the zone without really ever getting a shot off because you're waiting for that one opportunity. I think at times this year that made sense for them. I think lately because of how how much their scoring difficulties have been affecting things, we've we've kind of changed on that, right? We've talked about it, or at least I've talked about it, wanting to see them become a volume based team, just throw things on net try to generate dirty goals go to the net we talked about that with shane wright coming up we talked about that with jane schwartz being in the lineup um the kraken just need more of that so i, I think there is something to the idea of being a quality based team but when you are not scoring you have to become a qual quantity based team and they kind of haven't really made that shift in part because they just don't have those guys who's the volume shooter on this team besides bjorkstrand rj Nobody really. You yeah. look at the numbers and it tells you nobody. And the other, yeah, you just can't make mistakes. You can't hand the other team anything to if you go in the quality based approach. You have to keep things tighter in the D zone. Super chat here from Edward. Did last season really happen? With every passing game this season, year two feels more and more like a fever dream. I mean, I'll I'll start just saying that. I mean, when we were doing our season preview for this year, right? We talked about certain things that did feel unsustainable with that team, and we've kind of seen that come to fruition. Yeah, unfortunately, right? Like there was there was some stuff. We knew the shooting percentage was high last year. We knew they were going to need to get better on the power play to pick things up. Like that, like these were things that that we knew. Uh, we knew the goaltending was probably going to need to take a step forward. It did. The power play took a step forward. Um, we knew the shooting was going to regress. It regressed a lot, though, right? Like it overcorrected in a bad way. I mean, we talk about guys like Yanni Gord shooting below 5%, right? Like it, they went from unsustainably high to kind of ridiculously low, um, which we weren't expecting that. And I don't think we were expecting the defense to kind of fall apart the way that it did either. Right. Like tonight was another example of some of the basic issues that they've struggled with all, all year. But I think that the, the bones are still there from last season, right? Like it's still possible for them to be that team again. Right. I know a lot of people like to focus on the fourth line. Their fourth line is going to look pretty different next year. Right. It's going to it's going to probably be a lot of kids. Right. We might see Logan Morrison, Ryan Winterton and Ty Cartier as that fourth line. Right. And and all of a sudden you're going to have that energy back, that spark back, a decent amount of you know ability to put the puck away when when the time arises. Um, and so I, I think you're going to start seeing some of that stuff shift there. I just think the NHL has really changed in the last couple of years. It's been a fast change. We've talked about this a lot on the red glare. You need a guy who can just take over a game. You need a guy who you can play 20 to 22 minutes a night, who's going to be a point per game player. And the Kraken, that's the one thing they don't have. I think Shane's going to come in and help some of that, right? He'll, he, he's probably one of their top goal scorers next year if he plays the full season, just because of how he plays, where he plays on the ice. That's going to help a lot for them. Um, kind of offset the goal scoring difficulties they have, but you also got to then hope for what a, another similar season from Joey and, and Gru. That's possible. How likely is it going to be? I don't know. Goaltending, you never know. And that's, that's my big worry for next year is what if that falters, but I, I, you're just going to have to look different. I, and a uh, super chat here from Michael uh, replace Hackstall and staff as soon as the season ends. Uh, you know, we know where Michael's uh, you know, at with that. And then also a super chat here from Paul. And I kind of just want to combine the two because they're, you know, they're pretty similar. Uh, okay, fellas, don't sugarcoat it after not playing the kids. And after the recent decisions, is it time to fire Hackstall in your opinion? And I, I don't want to kind of cop out of this question, but it's the kind of thing that I'm just thinking about day to day, like this afternoon while, while doing the dishes right before before the Kraken game even started. I, I was thinking about that. You know, where do I really stand on this? And it's it's the kind of thing I'm going to think about for you know the next couple of weeks. And I think we'll have a real serious discussion about once the season ends. I don't know, Dylan, do you have anything more? I mean, it's pro my, my thought process is probably the exact same that Ron Francis is and what I laid out a little while ago, right? If he's going to come in and have a plan on how to fix some of the issues that they had this year, the fact that they didn't have a system at times or they had to change the system up too often or maybe it was a little late with the system change, if he's going to have kind of an answer to the idea of, of why they're struggling so much to score goals, why they didn't transition to be a... a um, a volume shooting team, something like that, right? If he's giving answers to these things, I think you can roll with him again, right? Like the players respond to him. 
maybe not so much recently. Again, it's hard to know without really being in the locker room what that's about. Um, it, it, how much of that is the players? How much of that is him? Um, but I, I think there are avenues there for him to stay. And I think that ultimately that's probably what the team would like. I mean, we, yeah. we know this organization. They don't like to rock the boat. They don't like to make big changes like that, right? Like, that's not what they want. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, it's, he's going to have some serious questions to answer at the end of the year, right? As anybody would in this position, right? Like I said earlier, it is a results-driven business, and the results this year were not there. And so he's going to have to answer to them, for them. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, and, that's what it is. And part of that process, too, you know, they've got the exit interviews. And I, and I think you, you do learn a lot from hearing from each individual player what they think of, of what happened, what went wrong and what needs to change. And um, I think that'll give Francis a pretty good indication, too. And that there's no way that you and I can know right now what's going to be said in those exit interviews or what what approach is going to happen. Um, but I think that'll be very telling. And I just don't think you can know at this point. Um, but I think if you were a fly on the wall for that whole process, you'd probably have a pretty clear indication one way or another. Right. Now, one thing that we've always talked about, RJ, and, and it, it certainly had seemed true for a long time, was that Haxtell and Francis were in lockstep about things. Right. Decisions were made after they would kind of come together and talk about them. And then decisions were made. This year doesn't feel that way. Right. And I think mm -hmm. there's no greater example of that than tonight with Logan Morrison and Ryan Winterton sitting it out. And and I do want like because that doesn't make sense from a Ron Francis standpoint. Right. Why would Ron Francis yeah. not want the young guys in there? You have nothing to lose by having them in there. You have only things to gain because they're getting more reps. You're getting to see them against a good team. Right. Like I get it. If the plan is that you want to ease them into the NHL. You want them playing the Ducks. You want them playing the Sharks. You want them playing these bottom five teams. That's fine. One, it'd be great if you could let everybody know. That would be nice. Um, yeah. But two, like, I don't know that that's, that's necessarily the greatest thing. I know that's similar to what the Ducks did with Leo Carlson this year, right? Like, they took, they, they eased him in. They did not have him play every night. They wanted him to just kind of get select games before he became an everyday player. I get that as a philosophy. Leo Carlson was 18 coming to North America for the first time. These guys are not 18. They're 20. They're 22, right? Yeah. Like, just get them in there. I wanted to see them against the Kings. I wanted to see them against a playoff team to see what they're made out of. Can they match that physicality? Can they match that intensity? So that feels like one of the things that was more so a hackstall decision because the playoffs were on the line, wanted to get the veteran guy in there. Right. Like it was going to be a physical game. Maybe you don't want a kid in the lineup for that um, rather than a Ron Francis one. And, and that just feels it just strikes me uh, how different that feels from the first two seasons where it felt like whenever there was a call up, the decisions were made all around that. And you really felt like both sides of the equation were on the same page about it. This one doesn't feel that way unless, like I said, the front office is on board with that. and The plan is to only play them in the soft, cushy games. But like, tell us that. Right. I think you'd, you'd save a lot of criticism, really, from everybody involved. I think everyone would understand if you were just kind of forthright about that. Um, and, and so, I mean, you know, I don't know, maybe like, again, when they get back home, I can <laughs> bug them about them and see and see what, you know, answer there is, if any. But yeah, it just doesn't it just doesn't make sense to why are you sheltering these guys? It's it's not even it's barely a playoff team. The Kings. I mean, they're they're the last playoff spot in the West. That's that's too big of a chance. I don't know. I, I've kind of covered it earlier. But anyway, we've got a super chat here from Light, and I'm sorry, Light, that it took so long to get to this because of all the the Hackstall conversation. But uh, super chat here. Just want to put this out there for the people who think Hack will not play Shane next season. Shane got more ice time than Maddie did tonight, and that is true. And also, um, if you look at the five on five stats, I don't know if you got the chance to check Money Puck before the game ended, Dylan, but. Um, the at five on five, Shane's line had the most ice time by uh three minutes with about 13 minutes of ice time. Uh, the Gord line was next with about 10 minutes. Yeah, well, again, it makes sense, and we've been talking about this right next year. The expectation, at least for me, and I, I kind of alluded to it earlier, but I'll really go on the record with it right now. My expectation is he's probably second on the team in goals to Jared McCann. Like, that's my level of expectation for Shane, right? I don't want want to totally put that on him but let's not all brush out there and start saying that but my expectation for him is that he's going to really perform next year um i think in part because of the style of play he has again look how effective the kings were going to the net tonight 
how many goals they generated off of rebounds, deflections, screening the goalie, right? Like they had the trifecta of what you could do by going to the net. Nobody on this team goes to the net with now, with the exception of Jaden Schwartz, but he's going to be inconsistent in your lineup. That's just who he is. And now Shane Wright. And so I think that's going to be a big part of it. I think Shane Wright's going to have to see a lot of big minutes next year, especially if Hackstall comes back, right? Because his job will really be on the line. He's going to need to put his strongest foot forward. And it, that is Shane Wright playing in the interior, generating chances for him and his line mates. I think his offensive upside is higher than Maddie's. I think that plays into it too. I will say though this, tonight, I felt like that line, it was out there a lot. I didn't see them a lot. And I didn't notice them that, a ton either. Right. Like, so there is, there's elements of it that need to be worked on. Obviously his game needs to grow. He's not going to come in right away and score a million goals. That's not going to happen. But um, I, I did feel like that was a good test for them tonight that they're, you know, Shane Wright's the kind of guy he's going to, he's going to take this experience. Know what he needs to work on. The coaching staff's going to know what he needs to work on. The front office is going to know what he needs to work on after a night like tonight where they did put him at the forefront and he didn't really have a strong performance. Uh, it wasn't a bad performance, but it wasn't a strong performance. And that that is, again, what this is used for. Again, I would love if the other kids were in there so you can kind of see what they need to work on against a better team. Um, but that is part of it. Yeah, definitely. Um, and and another reason, I'm just glad to see him in the lineup against LA and would, would like to see the other two. But, you know, there, there's going to be there's going to be stumbling blocks for it. Like any young player, and Ricky's saying, you probably expected to Maddie to be second in team in goals this year. And and yeah, I think, we, you know, we... I don't know about that high, but in in the mix, you know, so it it does prove the general point that, you know, you never know. But, um, you know, but but still, Shane, I mean, he's going to have to step up. Yeah, I, I don't know. I would have had Maddie probably outside the top three because, you know, McCann's going to be the guy. I would have expected. Number one for sure. I would have expected Bjorkstrand <laughs> to be up there the way he was. And I, and, and I would have probably said Berkey, to be honest. Obviously, the injuries weren't going to allow that in reality, but. Because Maddie's never going to be a goal scorer, right? He worked on his shot just to get it to an NHL level, but he he doesn't have an elite shot the way like Shane does. Yeah, yeah. And then <laughs> Patrick saying, uh, Dylan, go press the auto horn button for me on the Dactronics. Yeah. Patrick with the scorekeeping experience. We got a super chat here from Paul asking, is this a make or break off season for Ron Francis? What do you think? A, a thousand percent. Like there's no way that it's not, right? Because he will then have had, uh, what, uh, four off seasons to build this team. And if this team is not in the playoffs again next year, I think it's a clean house regardless of what happens, right? Like ownership, I can't imagine they're pleased with things. Again, the results in the result-driven business has not been good. That's the reality of it. Um, I think that's going to be something. I think the fact that, look, he has drafted well. The prospect pool is very deep considering they've only had three drafts. They will have a fourth this offseason. But it's built. Their prospect pool is built similar to their roster, which is outstanding value, great value guys, guys that can come in and can contribute a thousand percent. Who's the guy though, right? You could argue that the one that they have, because Matty Beniers is still a question mark in that regard, because the offense is Shane Wright, and Shane Wright fell into their laps. Oh yeah, right? like, definitely. He did. He did. The, the rest of the league gave you Shane Wright. So you have that, that that aspect of it, and then you have the fact that what's been his best free agent signing, Brian Dewey. Uh, yeah, I would say the, the the least yeah the least consequential. One. Aside from the ones right before the season starts, like a Donato or or signing sprung yeah. off the PTO. But yeah, I mean, best July free agent right. signing. Oh, but I think Ron Francis knows if you really you know talk to him and hear just his general philosophy, he knows that's a time for suckers, right? You know, there are very few good free agent signings at that time I, of year. Okay, but then go out and make trades. Yeah, right? no, like, trades he, trades are better. He's had he's had multiple off seasons. He's had multiple seasons. He's he, like I said, he's done a great job of accumulating value, whether it's through free agency, trades, or the draft. Him and his staff knows how to find the pieces that are going to outperform what you're paying them, for the most part. Then the free agents yeah. come in. And maybe that's not the case anymore with those guys. But like he's really, really good at that. That is fantastic. But you need more. You just do. And and that hasn't been there. And if it's the same case after another off season, after another season uh, where you could be making trades during the year, another trade deadline, I don't see how he survives past that. I don't see how any anybody as part of this, including maybe some players even, would survive that. 
Yeah, Francis has set the goal himself, you know, basically every season after the first one where the goal is to make the playoffs. And I think it's it's been a reasonable goal, uh, you know, in all those years. And he, he's going to have to live up to that one next year. Um, Viren asking, do you think Wright gets bumped down the lineup or benched because he didn't look as great tonight? It's possible. That's what Hackstall has done in the past. I was already thinking, like, one of the things for us to talk about is what are the lines going to be next game? They lost. So we know Joey will come into net. And mm -hmm. we know the lines will be different because that's just the way this team rolls. Um, I, don't, I don't know what it'll look like. Don't I would say don't. Why do it? Like again, you want to see you, you want to see him playing. You want to give him as many minutes as possible. That's the point of him being here. Um, but given the way Logan Morrison didn't play each of the last two games, Ryan Winterton was out of the lineup tonight for Tomas Tatar. He didn't really do anything. I don't know what Tatar totally added that Ryan Winterton couldn't have done. Um, I, I, who's to say? Yeah, I, who knows? I would I hope Winterton and Morrison back in the lineup, but uh, we'll see. And yeah, I, I'm glad you kind of agree. I wasn't really impressed with Tatar's game tonight. No, I mean, well, and this is this is the thing with with Tatar, and we've seen this from him all season, right? Like he he can be a dynamic piece offensively when put in the position where that's what his role is, that's what his job is, and playing on that line, that's not really what that line is doing right now. Like I, I don't, yeah. I don't know why you just put him in one for one for Ryan Winterton. I get you didn't want to shake up any of the other lines, but it, it just didn't make sense there. Yeah, Winterton's a better a just one to one fit for that line style of play wise. And the Storm talking about like we're communicating the message right about Winterton and Morrison. As much as I love Kraken fan podcasts, I doubt communication with the media is a priority with any hockey team's management. But I mean, if you look at that that article with Jeff Baker yesterday, where Ron Francis kind of put out, you know, what the plan, what the plan is with Hackstall a couple days ago, what the plan is with Shane Wright, where well, they went out and said, he's going to play five games, maybe a sixth and, and let everybody know what the plan is. Yes. He gave us those plans, but like there's, there's other things like every, every, well, I'm just saying you can do it. Like yeah. It's, oh, yeah. it's no, not no. something that teams don't do. They do do it. Yeah, no, it's doable. And there are plenty of other organizations that do it a lot more than this one mm -hmm. um and i i see that there was there was a comment i think it was from Viren who who said what why do you believe they'll play the kids on the fourth line because that's that's something that i heard tonight was that that was kind of the plan going back to the decisions made around the fourth line here like this for this season and and why you don't sign the other guys to multi-year deals was so that May, not maybe not for this year, but for next season, you're going to have a bunch of young players that you're going to want to give that fourth line to. Why was that never communicated to anybody? Why have all season long we've done nothing but be like, why didn't they bring back that fourth line? They could totally be helping out right now if if the plan was that. Right, because if you bring back like Donato, Sprong, Geeky, those are likely on multi-year deals, and that's taking up spots for guys like Morris and Winterton right. who you'd be hoping would be ready at this point. Right, and apparently that was the thought process. So like what? Tell us. <laughs> I know it's. I feel like it's not not that hard, um, but I don't know. It'll be interesting to see because you know on locker clean out day and everything. They'll we'll we'll have a chance to talk to Francis and we'll see how much he kind of lets on about what the plan is in a, in a bunch of different aspects. And I'll of course get, you know get all my questions ready and make sure that's kind of covered. But I think we're going to learn a lot around locker clean out day. Um, Hopefully. Uh, let's see. Uh, Viren, Dylan said McCann ben slash Beneers. RJ said McCann Bjorkstrand for goals leader. I can't remember if the second name was a dark horse pick. Oh, talking about Maddie Beneers, basically. Like, I, I see the conversation here about, um, you know, how much of a goal scorer we can realistically expect Maddie Beneers to be. Um, that's kind of been a lot of what the conversation's about. I know you said, you know, the quote, Maddie will never be a scorer, as Coop quoted you there. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. what What do you think we can realistically expect? Well, it, things will change also if Shane Wright becomes the scorer, right? If Shane Wright's going to be the 1C long-term and Maddie's going to be the more focused on defense guy, well, then, you know, the expectation is going to change just based on his usage and what, his, what it's going to be. Um, look, if Maddie's going to start, if Maddie bulks up and he starts playing more net front the way he is now on the power play and he brings some of that over to five on five, yeah, 30 goals isn't unrealistic for him. He has the vision. He has the understanding of things in the offensive zone to be to put himself in the right areas. He hasn't done it yet, but we know that he's <laughs> capable of it. But you can see it from him just watching him. He understands how plays develop. He can see it happening real time. He can see how defenses break down in front of him. 
Um, and he's really kind of only used it in more of a playmaking role. He needs to vary up his shot selection. We've talked about that in the past. There's things like that that are kind of holding him back, but they're mostly him holding himself back. It's more so the reason why I say that, it, well, one, even still, if he just turns into a 25-goal guy, I wouldn't consider that a, a goal scorer in, the, in today's NHL, right? Yeah, like, that's true. With the numbers being what they are and inflated as they are. yeah, That should be the expectation for somebody in the top six or a first line is the bottom line. So I, I wouldn't yeah, classify it, that as goal scoring. Yeah, and, and Pocket Waffles mentioning Bergeron is a 20 to 30 goal a year guy. That's basically who he gets compared to anyway. 20 to 30 goals, you know, in Bergeron's heyday, in, you know, 2013, 14, 15 uh, is a little different than 25 now. I, I think, like, uh, collectively our minds just haven't quite caught up, but eventually they they kind of will. Um, yeah. All right. So, <laughs> Julia, I'm sick of sunshine, so I'm leaving Florida to come coach the Kraken. Paul Maurice. We can dream. <laughs> Yeah, man. Okay. So as we, as we hit the hour mark here, I'll do a last call. Cause I mean, this must be a riveting beer league game in front of you. You'll probably want to go catch the end of that with all the goals I imagine are being scored given that goal horn. So we'll do a last call in chat, but I guess anything Dylan from, from being there in person in the at- atmosphere, any stories, anything else you want to share about this one? I, you know, not really. I mean, it's, it's a late season game, right. With, with one team that's out of it and got eliminated tonight, officially cracking. Um, like that, that's, it, it was what it was. Like I said, I was just happy that the Kraken had a better effort. Like, I do think that they are turn, they have turned things around from that low point, you know, right around that time that we had that one deep dive where it was really like, you know, at least show up for the fans, right? And then we saw ownership there and we saw them talking to the team and we saw everybody kind of on board. We had the, the Hackstall fan conversation. The team is better than they were, right? They're not necessarily having the same, you know, better results. But the team is playing better, and and that still that struck me seeing them in person again, because the last time I saw them was Arizona, which was you know right around the absolute bottom point for them. So like it was a pretty stark difference from the last time I saw them in person. And so that's that's kind of my takeaway is that I'm I'm I've kind of I'm turning a corner. I think I'm seeing some more of the positives. I'm seeing the effort change. I'm seeing things like Shane Wright be out there and and thinking that instead of, you know, dwelling on the fact that he disappeared in this game despite having all the ice time, it's that, look, I believe he's going to use that as a learning opportunity. He's going to use that as an opportunity for growth. That's what he's always done. Uh, no reason to think he won't continue that. That's that's who he is. And so I'm, I'm kind of just shifting into more of that kind of headspace and mindset. Okay, that's probably a healthier place to be. Zoe asking, though, did you guys say your favorite goal? So oh. Dylan, favorite goal in this one. And then Edward asking from the Kraken game or the beer league game that's on the ice now. I was just I'll let say, you. This game is five one. There's been some nice ones. Uh, let's see. I, favorite favorite Kraken goal. It's probably probably the Berkey goal, right? Like because that's just a sick pass from Bjorkstrand through the crease, like just kind of like a a, so, a wobbly saucer through the crease. Get it over to Berkey. Berkey's right there, net side. He's he's like at the crease. They crash the net and they get a goal from it. Like this is what we've been talking about. That's how you got to play when you're struggling to score. Okay, this is fun because with two goals, we actually do get to disagree. Because I'll I'll take that great pass from from Bjorkstrand, and I'll raise you that great pass from Yanni Gord. Just not no hesitation, doesn't even think about it. Just throws it right across the ice to Dumoulin, who he knows is there, and, and then the great shot to score. But I just I like a lot of what the Gord Karche Tanev line brought tonight. I thought they were really good, and, and I'm glad they got rewarded for that one. So that's why it's my favorite goal. Yeah, it was a full send from Yanni, and that's just always fun whenever you see that in the NHL. Definitely. All right. So uh, we're hour three mark here. Um, before we go, though, Dylan, one more question for you, though. How excited are you for the watch party next game? You're going to get to hang out with a lot of the community there at Flatstick Pub. Uh, you got to be pumped for it, right? Oh, I'm super pumped. I, I was fortunate enough to, to be able to talk with some fans here tonight. Um, uh, Jules is in, in chat here. I got to meet Jules. I mm-hmm. uh, got to talk with Rebecca. That. That was fantastic during the intermission. I'm super, it, it was a nice warm up for, to, for everybody at Flatstick on Friday. I'm super pumped for it. Super pumped too, because, you know, you're going to be playing the Ducks again, right? We get to see Shane Wright feast on a, feast on a bad team. It's going to be a lot of fun. Hopefully we'll see some kids in there again, just because lineup's going to change, right? Like there's a lot of positives and I'm just excited to be up in Seattle again too. 
Yeah, it's going to be great. And I'll put the graphic up here every one one more time uh, for the watch party Friday, April 5th, next Kraken game at the South Lake Union Flat Stick Pub. It's going to be a great time. Uh, Dylan's going to enjoy seeing everybody there. Lots of cool prizes you can win as well, including an yep. Afro plushie. I mean, that's yep. that's worth Afro going just for a chance of that. Uh, but it's going to be a great time, everybody. And uh enjoy the drive back hopefully the the traffic is all cleared out from la I'm there sure dylan has, but has it. <laughs> yeah I'm sh- knowing la i'm right sure why would, why would there, yeah why that's true there <laughs> yeah need, need to wait another couple hours but hey you got some great beer league hockey to enjoy while the that's traffic true. clears up uh, but big thanks to everybody for joining us tonight another thanks to everyone who gave super chats i know there were a lot of you in there tonight and uh we will see you next time with dylan at flat stick pub Uh, and me running the post game.